From working the counter in 7-Eleven to being a night cleaner at McDonald's, card counting in Vegas, and betting on horse racing in Hong Kong. This is the genius story of an American that exploited information that was available for all to see in plain sight. At 23, he was earning a meager $3 an hour, counting loose change and cleaning floors, just five years before he'd be banned from every casino in Las Vegas. He hammered the hell out of casinos and sports betting systematically for years. They've tried restricting his betting methods, banned him from entering, roughed him up and thrown him out, yet still, he come back and beat the house over and over again. He even left $118 million prize money unclaimed on purpose to make a point. Quite frankly, I've got no idea how this man's story hasn't turned into a movie yet. It certainly should be. But what can we learn from this gambling prodigy? If you want to make money betting, then you need to pay attention to this story, as it leaves lots of useful hints along the way. Born in 1957, Bill Bento was a bright kid born in a middle-class family. Following a run-of-the-mill childhood, he showed a distinct interest in numbers. In 1977, he studied physics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, before his attention flipped to games of chance in 1979. In particular, card counting. This compulsion was so strong that he upped and left for Las Vegas at the age of 22 years old. He'd been fixated on advantage play and card counting after reading Edward Thorpe's book called Beat the Dealer. I'm reading it myself right now and I can see why it got his attention. It's a good one. Although harder in practice, the premise is simple. You keep track of the count as cards are dealt to gain an unfair advantage in the game. To know the count is to know the expected chance of winning. When the expected value is stacked in your favour, you bet. The larger the advantage, the more you stake. Like all successful betting, you shouldn't expect to win every time, although using this method means that odds are stacked in your favour over the longer term. Card counting takes discipline, concentration and balls. For those who can pull it off undeterred, it's a surefire strategy for winning, which is why casinos hate people doing it. While Benter was refining these card counting skills, he'd been working at the local 7-Eleven for a few bucks an hour. Shortly after, in 1980, he'd taken another job as a night cleaner at McDonald's, which is where he was first introduced to another legendary gambler. Alan Woods. This was to be the start of a relationship that would shape betting forever. Woods was a more experienced card counter operating a team of disciplined individuals that would systematically hit the casinos together. Having a larger pool of talent and money meant that they were able to sustain individual mistakes easier and smooth out variance. Less than two months later, Bent was part of the team systematically cashing out the chips and getting thrown out of casinos. But by 1984, the reality was setting in. Much like sportsbooks today, the casino operators wanted to pick up their ball and go home when winners arrived. Eventually, he and Woods were listed in the Griffin Book, a record run by a prominent group of private investigators specializing in identifying card counters, cheaters, troublemakers in the casinos. Roughly half of the major casinos in the USA subscribed to the Griffin services at that time. After playing cat and mouse for a few years, they'd been forced to fold. A royal flush for the casinos, you might say. If only they'd been dealt a better hand, Sorry, I'll stop with the puns. They needed a new game and location to exploit, which is where they really cranked up the heat. I doubt they realized quite how profound their next move would be, but targeting Hong Kong was an extremely smart decision. At the time, it was worth a little under $10 billion every single year, accounting for one tenth of Hong Kong's tax revenue. The average person spent more on gambling than anywhere else world. Fortunately, the woke activists weren't tolerated either, so you could actually spend your money on whatever you liked. The pair knew these betting markets were incredibly inefficient and lined with gold. So in 1984, Woods flew to Hong Kong and began collecting as much information as possible. Bentner stayed in the States and taught himself to code whilst reading everything he could about statistical modeling and horse racing. It was clear. From the outset, Bentner wasn't interested in taking risk. He wanted to quantify all the statistical variables that he could so he could effectively price a horse's chance. Unlucky for him, time form wasn't yet a thing. Much like knowing the expected values in card counting, he knew that he could definitely beat the market if he could effectively estimate a horse's chance of winning. After nine months, Woods sent back heaps of records and Bennett began feeding them into the first version of his model. There was so much information to process and he needed to focus on code, so he hired two young fillies to do it for him. Come 1985, they were set. Equipped with three IBM computers, long before they were popular, he boarded a flight to Hong Kong. They were ready to go all in, but it wasn't plain sailing. Logistically, things were running nicely and the jockey club had allowed them to telephone betting privileges. Although the algorithm had lost them $120,000 by the summer of 1986. 
they only had $30,000 left. This is where things got a little bit awkward between Woods and Benta. At 29 years old, Benta had less cash and Woods demanded a 90% share of the partnership if they were to carry on. The defiant Benta wasn't happy with this and declined, although he wasn't gonna give up either. He flew back to Vegas and begged his friends to bankroll him, although they'd only stake him at playing blackjack. They didn't share his dream, so he didn't have much choice. So he doubled down for the next two years managing a team of card counters in Atlantic City. Being incredibly focused and living frugally, his pot stood at a few hundred thousand dollars by 1988. Once more, he headed to Hong Kong with a case full of cash and more front than Pamela Anderson. If you like that one, don't forget to smash it down below. The like button, the like button. On arrival, he must have been pretty pissed because Woods had developed the previous code with some help from other programmers and mathematicians, and it was now making money. There were only 20 or so variables in the system at this time, although that was enough to beat the market. During Benner's first year back, he made $600,000. Not too shabby for a 32 year old. The following year, he employed consultants, coders, mathematicians, other professional gamblers, and even a journalist. The objective was simple, improve the model's efficiency. As the system became more efficient, he increased the volume of bets. Eventually, he employed two women to submit bets to the Hong Kong Jockey Club full-time via the phone. Allegedly, they would relay up to 480 bets an hour. It had become a full-scale business-style operation. It was around then he made a massive jump forward by incorporating the odds from the paramutual pool. You see, like betting exchanges today, the fluid odds were dictated by the wisdom of crowds and publicly available. It's an extremely efficient source of information. Later, he would admit that it was the biggest single breakthrough that he had made. A year later, he made around $3 million in one season. He didn't go unnoticed though, as the jockey club called him in early 1993. Undoubtedly, he thought the game was over and he was about to get banned or restricted like his card counting days in Vegas. But they did the complete opposite, asking him what they could do for him. So he asked to submit his bets digitally, to which they agreed installing a customer input terminal. Now, Benta must have been absolutely ecstatic as this would allow him to place more bets faster and without errors. It was another dramatic improvement and between 1994 and 1997, he was raking it in. Halfway through 97, a somewhat political problem emerged though. The British were set to hand back the colony to China in July. For Benter and his team, this spelled a problem though, as they'd just won a massive jackpot. Ordinarily, the jockey club would present the winner in the media as a rags to riches betting tale. However, presenting a shy American who'd already won $50 million that year with the use of automated algorithms wasn't quite so good, especially during the Chinese handover. On June the 14th, his phone and computer betting was suspended and stopped dead in its tracks. They said they were acting to protect the interests of the general public. A little like modern bookmakers use responsible gambling regulation to ban winners in the UK. Same shit, different decade, I suppose. Benton went home with his tail between his legs, although he wasn't done yet. He wanted another crack of the whip, he just needed to find another way to place bets. Later that year, he returned with a monster pile of betting slips, operating from a small hotel room 15 minutes before the first race, he began printing slips on scale. With a few minutes spare, he scurried across the road to an off-track betting shop where he got his money on. 30 minutes later, he replicated the process once more. That wasn't all though, he'd arranged for several other team members to be doing exactly the same elsewhere in Hong Kong. It was a logistical nightmare, but they'd found a way to carry on. Excluding the additional expenses, it was almost as profitable as the previous years. At this point, he was well and truly back in business for a few more years. But by the millennium, he ran into a new problem. The Hong Kong tax authorities were becoming more and more interested. They wanted to know if the syndicate was acting as a business and therefore should be taxed. Supposedly, they contacted Adam Woods over the same issue who quickly fled to the Philippines. Then the system had come a long way now, incorporating 170 different variables per horse. And so he decided to make his biggest move yet an attempt to win the triple trio during a massive rollover. A bet where he would have to predict the first, second and third horses home on three different races. To put that into context, there were 10 million different possible outcomes for this bet. The prize was a rollover pot worth 118 million Hong Kong dollars. On one day in November 2001, he placed $1.6 million on 51,000 combinations and decided in advance. If he won, he would leave the prize unclaimed as he knew the jockey club would distribute the winnings to charity. 
which would be a great boost for their public image. After the first two races, he had 35 tickets that had predicted the first three runners in the first two races. As planned, the prize was unclaimed and Benton knocked his Hong Kong betting on the head, whilst the tax authority left him alone. Beyond winning the Triple Trio, Benton's betting activity has been kept a secret. Given the attention it brings, it's not all that unsurprising. You may have seen other stories on this channel that are equally as private, and for similar reasons. Benton's interest in betting on probability hasn't stopped though, with him frequenting Southampton as a visiting professor from 2004. In 2014, he gave an exclusive interview to their YouTube channel where he said, currently we have a project involving modeling and uncertainty in complex systems, which has been overseen by two of the professors here. I'm very, very pleased with the progress. Now make what you will of this, although I think anyone that thinks he's retired is being quite blinkered. In 2007, he founded the Benta Foundation, where he gives away money, and in 2012, he donated $1 million to Pittsburgh University. He's a true pioneer of betting and one of the first to apply science and maths to gambling on scale with the use of computers. My covers featured on this channel is clearly more about the game than the money, which leaves you wondering, has he retired or is he still operating on the betting exchanges today? Thanks for watching. If you found this video useful or interesting, please don't forget to tap the like button down below and subscribe for future content.